Hey now kids, you know, being a merchant and selling goods in medieval Europe and Asia is a fantastic theme that is so much better than destroying space pirates and fighting dragons. Said no one I would ever actually want to game with. <laughs> okay, that's a little harsh, but if Certainly, if you've been keeping up with my channel, you know by now that I am not a fan of the dry, old, heavy Euro game themes of just trading goods. Uh, other channels have called this trading in the Mediterranean. Not my style. Totally not my style. I can appreciate some of them, but you know, and I do like some Euro games, but they've got to have a better hook than that. So certainly I was hesitant to try the game we're going to talk about today, which is Istanbul. I mean, look at that cover. Look at that cover. Why would I like that? <laughs> but but I was encouraged to try it first off by um, Travis Chance, who is the designer of Infamy and the soon-to-be-released Heroes Wanted, both games that I've played, both games that are really, really quite good. Uh, I correspond with him sometimes, and he said that this is a very, very good game. He highly recommended it. And also, this is one of the candidates for the Kenner Spiel des Jahres for 2014. The Spiel des Jahres is the prestigious German award that's giving out to the best uh, all-around general family game that can be enjoyed by everyone. The Kenner Spiel des Jahres is a game given to heavier games that are more gamers games, gamerly games. Uh, the type that hardcore gamers are more likely to try, not necessarily the best for younger audiences or for older audiences who aren't really into gaming. So I was like, well, okay. I mean, look, there's obviously some something about this game, some kind of buzz about it. Uh, why don't I give it a shot? Uh, and like I said, this is, you know, I wasn't kidding at the beginning. This is a game about being a merchant. You're going uh, in Istanbul in ancient times. You're going around trying to sell goods in order to gain money, which you're going to use to eventually get, uh, well, more goods and <laughs> to get more money to improve your status as a merchant and to eventually turn that money into rubies, which are the apparently the ultimate status symbol of being a master merchant. Um, well, I'm going to hold my nose, dive one right into this one, and I'll give you an overview of the game, then we're gonna come back, I'll tell you what I think. All right, I'm gonna give you a very brief overview of Istanbul. This is a competitive game for two to five players. The theme is that you are a merchant in ancient Istanbul who is trying to become the best merchant. You're going to do this by acquiring money, using it to upgrade your merchant services and try to acquire rubies. The first person to get to five rubies or six rubies in a two player game, uh, these little things here, is going to be the winner. At the start of the game, you're going to take a number of discs in your color. You have, uh, you start off with five, let me make sure, four, I'm sorry, of your normal discs, which represent assistance, and you also get one thicker disc with a little sticker on it, which represents your actual merchant character. And you're also gonna get two little player boards here. One of them is just a double-sided rule sheet. The other, however, is your wagon. Uh, it starts off with uh, enough spaces to hold two of each of the type of goods in the game. You have uh, jewelry, uh, fabrics, spices, and fruits and vegetables, or just fruits. And then you have little spots down here to put the rubies that you're trying to acquire. Remember, you need five or six, depending on the number of players. You have all different types of denominations of money, and you'll start off with some money too, according to the player order. And you have your little first player token here. You have some discs uh, that are also represent assistance that you keep off the board, one for each player, because you will have to do something in order to actually acquire those extra assistants, or let's call them workers. Now on your turn, you can move your entire stack of discs up to two spaces, one or two spaces, unless you have a special ability. Now, wherever you end up, we'll call it the target spot. When you get to that spot, if you want to take the action of that spot, you must be able to drop off an assistant. So you'll literally pick up the rest of your stack of discs with the merchant on top and leave an assistant there. Then you're able to do the action of the spot. And this is how it's going to keep going on your turns. So when your turn comes around again, you can move one or two spaces. And when you end on a space spot where you want to be to use your ability, you have to drop off another assistant. Now, if it ever gets to the point where you do not have an assistant to drop off and you end up on a spot, you must end your turn immediately. And it also happens if you just don't want to drop off an assistant, you just end your turn immediately. You don't do any of the other steps. At that point, if you want to get more assistance, 
On future turns, you're going to have to move back to where you have an assistant, and you'll immediately reabsorb them into your stack, and you'll get to do the action. So you'll have to either do it that way, which is the long and hard way, although you might want to do it if you want to do all those actions again, or you can go back to your starting spot, which is the fountain. If you ever move back to the fountain, you'll be able to take all of your discs from across the board back under your stack. All the assistants come back to you, thematically speaking. Now, what do the actual spots on the board do? Remember that your goal here is to try to get these rubies in the best way possible, and there's multiple different ways to do that. The most straightforward way, I would say, is the gemstone dealer. There's a little track here. I know it's kind of hard to see. Um, you'll fill this up according to the number of players, but you'll have a little symbol with a coin on it. That indicates the cost you have to pay for the gem right underneath it. So at the start, if you're playing in a four, uh, four or five player game, there are, I'm sorry, four, yeah, four or five player game, then you'll pay $12, 12 a lira, and you'll be able to take this ruby and put it onto, or gem, or whatever you want to call it, and put it onto your wagon. But then you see that that uncovers the next spot, which says 13. So the next person, if even you, who wants to buy the next ruby has to pay 13, and so on and so on. That's It's going to escalate. And so at the very end, it costs 23 in order to buy the last gem. Now, other spots where you can get it. Uh, the wagon, now the, well, the Wainwright, this spot here. So when you go here, you can pay $7, 7 lira, in order to buy a piece of wagon. You'll actually, this is actually one of the neatest things about the components of the game. You actually take the little wagon piece, stick it into your player board, you can have a total of three of them. And this does two things. First off, it increases the amount of spots you have in order to gain goods. Um, actually, I'm sorry, I don't have the uh, little cubes out here, but there should be cubes here that indicate uh, that you'll be able to keep track of the goods that you have, and you'll be able to move them up. If you don't have extra pieces of your wagon, you'll be limited to two, but the more that you get, the uh, wagon sp spots that you get, the more goods you can carry at one time, which is really good because when you're moving around the different spots trying to sell your goods, you want to have as many as you can at a certain point. But if you ever are able to get a total of all three of your wagon pieces and you complete it not only is that good for having goods but as a reward you'll be able to take one of these gems here put it on your board now you have another point you can also go to the Sultan's Palace the Sultan's Palace has little pit icons indicating different goods um, you need to turn in every good up until the point where the next ruby is in order to gain that ruby and put it onto your player board so for example at the beginning here you need one jewelry one fabric, one spice, and one fruit, you're able to take the next gem. But then the next person that wants to acquire a gem has to put forth one more good of any type. Then the next person has to put forth another jewelry, which is the rarest type of good to get, the hardest one to get. So you can get jewels, gems that way, but it's going to get harder and harder. Now up in the top corners of the board, you have the Great Mosque and the Small Mosque, and these have player tiles on them. These are special powers that you're able to get once you acquire the tile. But in order to acquire the tile, you have to have a certain amount of goods. There's four tiles for each special power, and they escalate the amount of goods that you need in order to get them. So for here, you need spices. The first person that wants to get the first tile needs two spices, then you need three, then you need four, then you need five. Now you only need to prove that you have that many goods, and then you just have to spend one of that type of good. Even if you get the five tile, you still just have to prove that you have five, then spend one of those five in order to get it. You'll take that, put it on your board, and it'll give you a special ability. If you gain one of each tile from each of the mosques, you'll get to take one of the gems there, put it on your board. That's another way to get gems, which are victory points. What some of the powers do, uh, here you're able to, uh, if you go to one of the spots that gets you goods, you're able to spend two lira to get any good of your choice. Um, this one here, there's a couple situations where you'll need to roll dice in the game, uh, hence the dice that I have right here. And in this case, you're able to, you if uh, you can either re-roll the die or make one of the die into a four, which can be very, very helpful. Over here, you can spend two lira to summon one of your assistants back to you instead of having to go back to the fountain or go back and conglomerate them again the hard way. And this one is very simply, you are able to gain your worker. You can only have one of each of these tiles, obviously. And remember that the goal is to have both of them from each of the moss in order to get the most gems possible. Uh, the other really unique spot on the board is where you see these other little cylinders these are your family members thematically speaking and it's pretty weak thematically speaking is that these are like your nephew or niece who have gotten in trouble with the law and they've been arrested at the police station and when you go there you break them out of jail for free well you either break them out or you but you uh 
you plead with the person there in order to let them out. And then they're able to go to another spot on the board and do the special ability for you. Uh, the downside here, though, is that when another player's merchants go onto a spot where your family member is, they automatically catch them in the act of doing something bad, and they turn them in and send them back to the police station. And they'll actually get a reward for doing so, a bonus card and such, which we'll get back to in a moment. Uh, different other spots on the board, the small market and the large market. Here is where you can take those goods that you have and try to turn them in for money. There's different tiles here that you're going to cycle every time you go to the market and they'll show five different goods. The large market has a larger concentration of jewelry, um, which means it's harder to turn in goods there, but you get more money for doing so. In order to get the most money, you're going to have to try and turn in as many of the types of goods that are on here. So here you have a jewel, jewelry, two fruit, and two spice. For every, if you turn in one of those five, you'll get two dollars. If you turn in two of those, you'll get three. Uh, if you, I'm sorry, you'll get five. If you turn in three, you'll get nine, and so on. Up to 20 here and up to 25 in the large market. So the more of those particular sets that you can trade in, the better you're going to get, the more return you get. You can use that money to either buy more stuff, more uh, parts of your wagon, or to buy gemstones, or to use for the special ability. So money is never a bad thing to have. There are three spots on the board that are just going to let you max out your three generic goods, the spice, the fabric, and the fruit. You'll just go to the spice warehouse, the fabric warehouse, or the fruit warehouse, use a special ability there by dropping off an assistant, boom, you get to move them up to your max, which is really good if you've already put added extra spots to your wagons. The post office is kind of an odd space. You're going to go here and you'll get each of these different pictures pictured. So in this, at the beginning, you'll get a, a spice good, fruit good, and then a total of $2. But then you have to move the leftmost cube down. The next player that go there and take that action is going to, instead of getting that spice, you're going to get fabric, $2 and a fruit. And then you'll move this down and so on and so forth. So you have a constantly fluctuating amount of stuff that you get on that spot. The black market is an interesting place where if you go there, you'll get one of the three generic goods of your choice, and then you roll the die. You'll roll the die, and what you're trying to get is between a 7 and a 12. If you get a 7 or an 8, you'll gain one jewelry. If you gain a 9 or 10, you're going to get two jewelry. And if you get an 11 or 12, you're going to get three. And this is one of the spots where it's helpful to have that die ability to change one to a four. The other spot where you can roll the dice is the tea house. This is gambling, essentially. You're going to bet a number between 3 and 12 and hope that you get... Uh, either greater than or equal to that number. If you do, whatever number you bet, you're going to gain that in money. If you don't, you get $2 as a consolation prize, so it's not totally worthless for you. And let's see, what else have I not covered here? I think the only thing I haven't covered so far is the caravansary. Now, the caravansary is where, uh, at the beginning of the game, each player is going to start with uh, these bonus cards here. And if you go to the caravansary, you're going to be able to draw two more bonus cards, uh, pick one of them, I yeah, you'll pick one to discard and keep the other. And the bonus cards are useful, just they have a variety of special abilities that are going to help you during the course of the game. So I'll just go through with a few of them here. For instance, this one here is going to let you, uh, sorry, just check here because I forget what some of these do. You get to return one of your assistants to the merchant stack just by playing these cards. You can play any number of these cards on your turn as you like. Um, this one is going to let you go to one of the merchant house, the small market or large market, and turn in any good that you want in order to uh, satisfy the needs of the market and get the money, uh, the corresponding amount of money. Um, this one, if you're if you're at the gemstone dealer, you can carry out that action. I'm sorry, <laughs> if you're at the gemstone dealer, you can carry out that action twice. This one simply simply gives you five dollars. Um, this one lets you carry out the mailman action twice, and so on. That's that's mostly what they do. Some of them let you move extra spaces. Uh, but when you discard one, you'll actually put it out here on the board. Then when someone else takes the action, they have the option of taking from the discard as well of, of the, uh, the total stack of cards. The only other thing I haven't really mentioned are these two other cylinders out on the board, which are the governor and the smuggler. At the beginning of the game, you'll randomly place these out on the board by rolling the two dice. Uh, each of the numbers corresponds to different spots on the board. And when you land on one of those spots, in addition to taking your action, the last thing you can do is have an encounter 
with the, either the governor or the smuggler. Also, if there's a family member there, you might have an encounter, quote unquote, with them and arrest them. But if it's the governor, you can choose to draw a bonus card from the face down deck and put it in your hand. But in order to do so, you have to either discard one of your bonus cards or pay $2. If it is the smuggler, you can gain a good of your choice, but again, you have to either pay two or trade in another type of good. So that's really the whole game. Um, oh, I'm sorry, one other thing. If you land on a spot that has any other merchants on it with your merchant, you have to pay every player's merchant that's on that spot $2. If you refuse to do so or you can't do so, your turn ends immediately. So this game encourages you staying away from your neighbors as much as possible unless you really want to pay, uh, pay them. But that's it. You're running around the board. You're trying to gather money in order to, and gather goods in order to eventually build yourself up into getting as many of the gems as possible. The first person to get to five gemstones is the winner or six in a two-player game. That's this symbol. All right, let's take it from the top, work our way down. First off, components, really like it. They did a really good job with this. The, uh, the boards are really heavy cardboard with uh, really good quality artwork on it. I like the artwork in this game quite a bit. Um, that can be a sticking point in a lot of different Euro games. They did a good job here. The design, the graphical design all looks really good. Uh, good quality components. The wooden discs that everyone used to represent their merchants and their assistants moving around. Um, the, while those certainly aren't the most uh, fantastic, amazing, interesting components. They were pretty necessary here simply based on the nature of the game, having to stack them up and move around. Although, this is just kind of a digression, but I what would have been cool is that back when my friends and I used to play Dungeons & Dragons 4th Edition, uh, this company called Aaliyah made these really cool rare earth magnet discs that you could put underneath your miniatures or tokens or whatever you use to represent your heroes and they would be used to represent status effects and it worked really well especially in fourth edition which was all about different status effects on your characters and they would stick together really well but they wouldn't repel other magnets when they when they got close to other stacks of magnets so i thought that would have been a cool idea for this game um you would have it, you could even pimp it out if you really wanted to i was kind of thinking of looking for mine although you still need to have a disc that was different than the others to represent your actual merchant and you still need something for the family members as well but um i i can't complain i mean there's a lot of iconography in this game which is kind of annoying but they do that for a reason that's because they need to make the game language independent and it really really is as long as you know the rules if this you know if whatever copy of the game you have if it's not your native language have someone teach you the game get a translated copy online and you don't need to worry about it at all because there's no in-game text to really worry about other than the names of the places um, so components design all looks really really good now the theme of the game eh, <laughs> i mean this is a euro game and certainly some of them have better themes than others uh, you're certainly not going to feel like you're a master merchant running around the streets of Istanbul building your uh, <laughs> spice empire. The spice must flow. You're never going to feel like that. And really, who cares? Do you want to feel like that? I've never woken up in the morning and like, oh, man, I just wish today I could feel like I am grabbing goods from one spot and dropping them off at another and getting money for them and feeling like the best merchant in all of a foreign land that I'll probably never go to. I've never had that feeling. So I don't really care in this case that the theme is not connected well because I wasn't expecting it to. So let's go right into the mechanics. I like this game a lot. I do. I like, uh, I mean, it's simple. It's, you know, we had this up and running in less than 10 minutes, um, which it when you're looking at all the different components and you're seeing all the iconography on the board, it doesn't seem like it's that likely, but it really is. Once you get into it, it's not a very difficult premise. You're moving around the different spots, dropping off assistance. If you need to do more actions, but you don't have any assistance left, you go back and get them back. Either you, you hop back on them or you try to get back to the fountain and well and bring them all back to you. And while that's not the most thematic thing in the world, like I was just saying, it all works together pretty smoothly. I like the mechanics of this a lot. Um, it's it's a race. I mean, more, I mean, you could say a lot of games are a race in a way because most games, especially Euro games, have a limit. How many rounds you're going to play or the point threshold, something like that. But because the point threshold here is so low, five rubies uh, or six in a two-player game, then that means that it feels there's more pressure on you. But I like that because it keeps the game from dragging out too long. This is This can be very brief. I would say your first time playing is probably going to be a little bit over an hour just because you're learning the rules and you're learning. Uh, there's probably going to be some AP analysis paralysis as you're trying to figure out the best way to plot your route. 
But uh, the second game of this that we played, much, much faster. And I think that if you play even more games of it, it's gonna, you're going to cut that time, time down drastically, even if you are playing with four or five players. Because it's pretty intuitive. I mean, you pick, you can kind of pick a strategy in the beginning of how you're going to do it. And that's what I like, too, is that you have different routes to victory. Like, the first game that I played, I decided, this is kind of sort of a worker placement game. I'm going for more workers. Always go for more workers. And I did it, and it was kind of working for me in the beginning, but I found that my engine stalled later on. I, like, I got to three rubies before anyone else did, and I thought, all I need to do is maintain this lead, but I couldn't maintain this lead, because I didn't worry about my uh, wagon. I didn't get more slots for my wagon, which meant that I couldn't hold more goods, which meant that I was making much less money than the other players, uh, you know, in a much slower rate, which meant that I was going to have a much harder time as, as well trying to get the other tiles from the mosques, which were going to be, so I couldn't afford to get more rubies from the, um, the gem dealer, and I couldn't have the spots in my uh, wagon in order to go and trade in goods to get from the mosques, the tiles from the mosques, which would let me get more rubies. So there's lots of different ways to get rubies, but you have to plan it out. And you, you know, planning that route is all important. Um, and you, if you don't plan accordingly, you are going to stall, which can be a frustrating experience. But be, like I said, the game is not too long and it feels fast. The turns go around very quickly. Um, especially if you know what you're doing, excuse me. <laughs> uh, I'm in Florida, there's mosquitoes. Um, so I really enjoyed that aspect of it, that it felt fast and fresh and unique, and like I always had something to do and different routes that I could take. Um, if I had a complaint about the game, aside from the theme, it would be that, again, that race aspect, it can feel like, oh, I finally got my engine going and the game's over. <laughs> oh, you just won, okay, great. That can be a little demoralizing, but again, that is the penalty you pay for not being that guy and doing better and having your engine going better. I think that this game, um, even though it's for the Kenner Spiel des Jahres, which is supposed to be a more complex game, like I said, it's relatively simple, but I think there's enough depth and strategy here that it can keep gamerly gamers, as I like to say, coming back to the table. Um, I like the different actions of moving around, like taking, uh, getting your family member and having them do things for you. There's little neat things like the way the post office works and the way the marketplace works, uh, the black market, the little dice rolling. There's just so many neat little things that they're not that complicated. They don't add a, like a ton of uh, fiddliness to the game, but they feel cool when you do them. Different things you can do, different aspects, there's a surprising amount of game in this game, and it's going to go down as one of a select few Euro games that I really, really enjoy. I'm, I'm really looking forward to playing it again, and that's probably the highest praise that I can give to any game because I play so many new games that it's always on to the next thing, but I'd like to revisit this one before I play anything else. And for me, that's a pretty good sign that it's a pretty decent game. My name is Nick, this has been Board Game Brawl, and I'm reminding you to get out there and game every day in every way. Take care.